Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, everybody. Bless the Lord. One more time. It's, <coughs> you know, a privilege to be alive, you know, and to be here with us again to share in the word, you know, of the Lord. Amen. You know, God is such a good God, you know, when we look around us and see the things that are happening, you know, we know that something is in the atmosphere. And, you know, I would encourage each and every one of us to, you know, make our calling an election sure. Because anytime now, Jesus can put in his appearance. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear, well done, though good and faithful servant. Amen. Bless the Lord. Let us just bow our heads as we pray, you know, before we get into the word of the Lord. Father, we come before you one more time and we want to thank you for this privilege that you have afforded us to come, to share, to hear, to listen, Lord Jesus, what it is that you have to say to us. Lord Jesus, all things work together for good. And we pray tonight, Lord Jesus, that you will touch every heart, every mind, every soul that tune in. Lord, not just tonight, but even in the future. We ask, mighty God, that you will touch, Lord, lives, mighty God. Lord Jesus, you said, other sheep you have who have not yet come to this fold. And we pray, God, that through the talking of doctrine, God, that you can use this word to save some. We ask, mighty God, that you have your own way, that you be in our midst, and that you bless the proceeding tonight as we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Again, you know, I greet us in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name. You know, my understanding is that the Prime Minister will speak tonight and what we are seeing is that there's no reduction you know in the rate of transmission of the COVID-19. Let me also implore us before we get in the word to continue to be safe, continue to abide by the protocols and continue to believe God because when all is said and done you know and we talk about it we must you know just exercise our faith in God and you know, God will, when we do our best, when we abide by the protocols and we do our best, we have to just rely on the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so you know our team scripture, first Timothy four, verse one. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat which god had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth i charge thee therefore before god and the lord jesus christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not end your sound doctrine, but after their own loss. Shall they heed to themselves, teachers having itching ears? And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn unto fables. Amen. You know, so we have been looking at the apostles' doctrine and we have been looking on doctrine overall. We are at the point right now because we had went through in some previous weeks um, about, you know, what is doctrine, why is it important, and what makes a good doctrine. So now we are looking at the apostles' doctrine. Amen. And we said that doctrine was, the apostles' doctrine was really the teachings and the instructions 
that the apostle received from Jesus. And then these teachings, they then relate to us. They then taught us, you know, through the scriptures, um, the same teachings that they received from Jesus. The Bible in the book of Acts 2, verses 42, and, you know, we just want to read it another time to, for emphasis. Verse 42, amen. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread, hallelujah, and in prayers. Amen. So Jesus taught the disciples while he was here on earth. He taught them and he instructed them and, you know, his expectation of them was that they would carry out his instruction when he left earth. And they believed that the other disciples that they made, other Christians, that they would do the same, carry out instruction that was given to them. But like I have been saying, and like the scripture have said, that, you know, there will become a time when men will not endure sound doctrine. And it, it is not just happening now, but now we are so privy to, to everything. We are in the age of technology and we are able to get everything just by the touch of a button. We are more exposed and we are seeing some things that were there, but, you know, we weren't so privy to them. So right now, nothing is hiding. And like we said, we are on lockdown. So church as we knew it is not like it, it was. We are not able to go out. We are not, you know, last week we had service and only 20 persons were able to come out just to stream the service online. And while we give thank God thanks, it is not what we used to. But what we are seeing now is that there are so many preachers and teachers online and I, under the Holy Ghost, want us as people of God to be careful of those whom we listen to and to the things that we entertain. Because if we are not careful, we will be drawn away onto, into something that is not a doctrine, that is not scriptural. And we have been talking and we have been mentioning, you know, like when we talk about repentance, and we did everything from the Old Testament come into the New Testament. And we have been laying down the scriptures so that we can get an understanding that what I am saying to us, it is not based of something that I conceptualize. It is not something that somebody tell me, uh, but it is coming from the word of Almighty God. And we, we went into it that, look here. We're supposed to accept the word because it is inspired. It is God breathed. God breathed upon men and they wrote the scriptures as they were inspired to. So, so we can take the word of God. Anything, it is there to govern us how we should live, how we should serve the Lord. And it's written so that we might get a better understanding of God. Amen. So, we said that the vital component of the apostles' doctrine was really the plan of salvation. And if you go through the passages, the, old, the New Testament, you will recognize that they always preach, they always teach, write about persons um, being saved, especially in the book of Acts, what, which was an action book. And then, but if you read down the other epistles, you'll see where Paul had a burden, you know, for, for the church and for the church to remain saved. So the main thing that they talk about was really the plan of salvation from mankind. You know, and it's, compromise, it's comprised in five basic components. Belief, which we went through. Repentance, which we will do a quick recap on. And then we will look at water baptism. My hope is that, you know, I would be able to complete Water baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost tonight. Not sure that that will happen. But look here. We're talking about the doctrine. We're talking about, you know, that which we identify with. That which we 
believe in. And, you know, if we spend an extra Wednesday talking about just repentance, and it might look simple to some people because some people, you know, you know everything about baptism already. And I tried to find the mind of God. And, and when the Lord impressed upon my heart that, to, that I should talk about doctrine, I did not plan to spend so much time talking about repentance. Um, but as I went through, I recognized that there was just a burden that, you know, something need to be clarified for somebody. Somebody need to know about restitution and so that they can receive the Holy Ghost. And I just followed the burden of the Lord and I just went with it. So even as it pertains to baptism, look here. As we look at the lockdown and we look at all that is happening, no more than ever we need to be preaching and, and, and telling folks what to do in order to be saved. So I am not, I am not even questioning what, you know, the, how the Lord is leading me, and, and I'm just coming here to present what God has given me to present, what he has laid in my spirit. Because chances are, yes, we might be strengthening somebody, Somebody might be doubting. But chances are, there are folks that Jesus wants to save. Because the time is saying no, that his coming is near, and, and those who should come, he's going to call. And if this is the medium that God is used to, to win, look here, is I would like that when we are through, if one person receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if one person get a direction, then I would accomplish the will of God. It is not his will, the Bible says, for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we said that, you know, the five basic components is belief, repentance, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Spirit, and living a holy life. So we spoke and believe, and we look at repentance last week. One of the points we made as we look at the doctrine is to look how the Old Testament scriptures line up with the New Testament scriptures. And we recognize that the doctrine that the apostles passed down to us, it wasn't something that was started in the New Testament, but scriptures upon scriptures and scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, um, complemented New Testament scriptures and they line up so that we know that look here what we get in it, it is not a fly by night but it has it is rooted and grounded in the Old Testament and we can see it here in the New Testament so we said we mentioned the scripture Isaiah 28 9 to 10 and this is a scripture that I need us to, 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 to bear in mind. This is a scripture I want us to take in heart, to understand and to know that, look here, doctrine is a serious thing, right? And the scripture said, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. So we said that repentance, there was a call from God throughout time to man that he should come to repentance. We look at scripture like Isaiah 55, 6 to 7, and we said, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So from the beginning of time, from ever since man sinned, you know, God has been calling him to repentance. 
We also mention about Joel 2 verse 13. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is a gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. We even mention Jonah and Nineveh because God wanted to bring the word to Nineveh so that Nineveh might repent. Jonah, the prophet, did not want to go to Nineveh because he thought that the folks at Nineveh were wicked and he did not want, he felt that if, if, if he preached the word that the people would repent and that God would spare them. And while God told him that, look here, go and preach to Nineveh, Jonah refused. At the end of the day, Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached the word. And Nineveh repented. And God speared them. So there is always a call, whether it be an individual, whether it be a nation. God is always calling folks to repentance. Even today, to those who are in sin and know not Christ, there is a call still for them to come to repentance. Amen. And that call will not stop until a person dies or until the rapture comes. But whichever way you take it, God is always calling folks to come to repentance. Then we also said that John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, came and he preached baptism unto repentance. So the forerunner of Jesus Christ. So from the Old Testament, God has been calling men. And then John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, he came and he preached baptism unto repentance. Jesus also preached repentance. And we mentioned scripture like Matthew 4, verses 17. From the time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles also preached, Amen, repentance. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. So on the day of Pentecost, yes, Peter preached repentance. And following after that, all the other apostles, they preached repentance. What is repentance? We said that it is a turning from sin and turn to God. It's a change of mind and it's a change of desire. It's turning from sin, but it's also a dedication to God. So if there's anybody who asks, why do I need to repent? Scriptures like Romans 3 verses 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a death sentence upon men. Amen. It means that those who are outside of God and Christ, there is a death sentence on their life. And hence, the need is there for them to repent. For them to repent. Romans 5 verses 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed unto all men, for all have sinned. Even David, the great king, sinned. And he said in Psalms 51 verse 5, when he was repenting, he said, I, Behold, I was shaped in sin, shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Why should you repent? Because the wages, Romans 6 verses 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if persons continue in their sin, the pay that you're going to get for that is eternal damnation. And I would encourage anyone to Repent. No, there is no repentance in the grave. So I would encourage anyone right now. I don't know what it is that you might be contemplating on, but I would suggest that repentance is something that individuals need to be considered if you have not yet repented of your sin. What is it that we need to know about repentance? There must be recognition. 
Romans 5, verse 12, and Romans 3, verses 23. Before someone can repent, he must recognize that he is a sinner and recognize the wrong that he has done. You can't tell somebody that they're wrong if they don't identify the wrong. So the first thing a person must do if he's going to repent is to recognize that he is a sinner. The next thing that we need to know is that there must be godly sorrow. And I said last week, and when you come on to repentance, you will hear me repeat it. I don't understand how is it that person can believe. Know that when you go to an altar and you lift your hands and you pray the prayer that somebody tells you to pray, I can't see through that how is it that that is being sorry for your sins. When a person is sorry for their sin, nobody have to tell them, look here, pray this prayer after me. But when a person is genuinely sorry for their sins, they will pray the prayer to God and say, Lord, forgive me because I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I have done wrong. So there must be godly sorrow. And then there must be confession. Scriptures like Proverbs 28, verses 13. God knows everything. Yes, he knows everything. But God is a principal God. God wants you to come to him and say, look here, forgive me of my sins. You could be saved years and you, you have done wrong. If you have done wrong, God wants you to come to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Proverbs 28, verses 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them, amen, shall have mercy. Whosoever confesseth them and forsaketh them. So it tells us that we need to confess it to God, but it tells us that we must also have a made up mind that we're not going to do it again. Or we will try not to do it again as best as possible. Amen. So what we need to do as individuals is to have that determination that while we confess to God and say, Lord, this is the thing that I have done and I'm asking you to forgive me for it. What it is that we need to do after that is to forsake it. Sometimes folks will be troubled by a besetting sin and even when you confess, You still go back and to do the thing, do the thing, and you wonder what is happening. It is just because the mind is not made up to forsake the thing. And so as individuals, when we confess, there should be a made up mind to for, forsake this, that thing. If we forsake it, the Bible said, then we will have mercy. Amen. So confession is made directly to God, and we made the point that, look here, there is no need for an individual to go before a priest that is sitting in a box and say, oh, confess your sins to me and I will take it to God. No. The Bible says it is only the Lord God alone that can forgive sins. Mark 2, verse 7. Why do it this man thus speak blasphemous? Who can forgive sins but God only? Isaiah 43 and 25. I, even I am... He that blotted out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. So I want us to know that there shouldn't be any form of confession to any man. When you confess to the man, what is it that the man, you're going to tell him your business. Amen. And he can pray for you. Yes, if, if you want help for somebody to pray for you, yes, we understand that. You can, you can talk to somebody. But if somebody is saying, come to confess your sins to me, that your sins might be forgiven. No man can forgive sins but God. And we made the point that individual. And then no, the strange thing is happening is that even today, individuals are believing that if they go to a priest and confess, that their sins will be forgiven. And then we also made a point about repentance of restitution as part of forsaking our sins. The truly repentant person will seek 
to correct the impact of the past wrong that he has done to others. Amen. You might not be able to correct all the wrong, but as best as possible. And I related the story to us last week of this friend that repented. Amen. He was at the altar and, and after the Holy Ghost spoke to me and I spoke to him and I told him that, look here, God said, your faith is there, but it's only restitution you need to get right. And I told him, and the gentleman came back to me and he said, look here, it's true you're talking. Because there were three persons that were in the community. And, and, and they moved, but it just, they never moved while we were on good terms. And the person found two of them and he made it right with them. And then the third one he could not find, but his heart was now at the place where he was saying, God, if I find the person, I would say, ask the person, it, the person put down his pride now and was willing to ask for forgiveness. And God gave that person the Holy Spirit. We mentioned Zacchaeus, that Zacchaeus said that, Lord, I will give half of my goods to the poor. And if I take anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore him fourfold. We also mention scripture like Matthew 5. 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and remember that thy brother had ought against thee, leave therefore thy gift before the altar and go thy way first. Go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly. While thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. So don't go give God, or think that you're going to give God anything, except you'll be right with your brethren first. For the Bible did say, how can we say that we love God? When we don't love our brethren. So you want us to be aware then brethren. That we have got to now reach to the point. Where we are willing to make it right with our brethren. That we can see before we take our offering to God. Amen. Amen. So tonight now we look at water baptism. Amen. And this is a, a, a very sticky topic. And... But we hope that under the Holy Ghost that, you know, somebody will, might, might receive some form of revelation. Somebody might understand what is it that they are in. And that even if you're not involved or in the truth, that you will some way find a way to be involved with the truth. Amen. So we know that water is life. Amen. Our what, local water commission, that is their, their tagline. You know, water is life. A man in the desert cannot wait for even the smallest sip of water. This is rightly so because he needs it to sustain his life. When he finally receives that water, there is a sense of relief and joy. And he wants to drink more if there is more. Water does sustain life. But is it also a cleansing agent? And the God of the universe chose to use this cleansing agent as an essential part of baptism. So, we cannot question God, why is it that, you know, you choose to use water for the remission of sin. God could have used anything else. But he said, look here, water it is, and water it shall be. Amen. So, though... The word baptism was not mentioned in the Old Testament. I want us to know that it has always been in the mind of God. It has always been the intention of God for water baptism to be a part of the plan of salvation. Amen, somebody. So we want to now look at 1 Peter 3 verse 21. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. 
the like figure whereunto even baptism doeth also no save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter mentions the event of the flood. So if we look further in the passage, we'll see where the Apostle make mention of the flood in the days of Noah. During the building of the ark. Only a few persons were saved. Eight persons, to be exact, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now save us. So what Peter was saying, the like figure unto that which happened in time past. When once the long suffering of God. All right, let me read verse 3, 1 Peter 3 and 20. Which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So the Apostle Peter mentioned the flood and that eight souls were saved. And he was saying, No, oh, baptism. Which correspond to this now saves us. During these events, sinners were washed away, so to speak. And Noah and his family were saved. Water brings both death and life. It brings forth destruction to the unrighteous and the saving of the righteous. So eight righteous was there. So God tell Noah that look here. Flood is going to come. Nobody has ever seen flood before. And Noah preach. Like we are preaching now. And the people refused. And it was not until the sea water start coming from above and coming from beneath. That is the time they want to go in the ark. But God shut the door. So just as all eight souls were saved. So it is that baptism do it now save us. And the apostle was saying that what took place in the flood was likened unto it was a shadow of water baptism. If we look carefully even at the passage, we would recognize that in typology, That the church was there and the salvation plan was laid out. Look back at the passage. Water and wood. And water for baptism for us and the wood for the cross was there. Noah, the just that preached the Christ. Noah was a type of Christ. And we look at the dove that came Back with that thing in his mouth. That straw in his mouth. A type of the Holy Spirit. And we look at the ark. It was a type of the church. So we recognize then from there. That God was preaching. Or talking about the plan of salvation. That should come in future time. Let us also go to 1 Corinthians 10. Verses 1 to 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that he should be ignorant or that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And what did he say now? And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
So the apostle identified the crossing as the, of the Red Sea as a type of baptism. Literally, the liberation of Israel from slavery of Egypt announces the liberation wrought by baptism. Once again, we see water brings forth death to the unrighteous, those who try to destroy Israel while they were leaving Egypt. But it also brought deliverance to the righteous. So I am saying to us that in the mind of God, in the thought of God, the plan process, their baptism always existed. And it was a part of his plan that there is coming a time when man would have to baptize in order to be saved. Just as our water delivered them in the past, so it is that with us as Christians, today, water will deliver us. That which the Jews consider to be the crossing of the Red Sea, the apostle calls baptism. That which they believe to be a cloud proved to be the Holy Spirit. The Exodus was their salvation from slavery. They were saved through water and the cloud. And the cloud was a sign of God's presence with them as they wander through the desert. As we come over in the New Testament, we see where John the forerunner, just as how John the forerunner preached baptism unto repentance, we see where John the forerunner preached about baptism. It was a baptism unto repentance. So he came now, the, yes, they were familiar with repentance because God has always been calling them to repentance. But baptism was now a new thing. This man come on the scene. So with all of the prophets that, that spoke before, nothing was mentioned about baptism. But then here was the forerunner of Jesus Christ that came on the scene and he baptized many. Let us look at Matthew 3, verse 11. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Again, Mark 1, verses 8, verse 8. He said, I baptize you with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Find for me Luke 3 and 16. John answered all of them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The straps whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So when John came on the scene, as I was saying, that it was a new thing. They knew not, nothing about baptism. Um, but then the folks now recognized that this was a new thing. And many of them flocked John to be baptized. Baptism was also, so we are saying now that baptism came there from the Old Testament right into the New Testament. We are saying that the forerunner of Jesus preached baptism unto repentance. And then now, we are saying that Jesus himself, baptism was accredited to Jesus even though he baptized none. Scripture for that St. John 4, verse 1 and two. So Jesus, though he baptized none, baptism was accredited that yes, that he baptized individuals. Now Jesus learned. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard 
that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. So though Jesus baptized none, it was accredited unto him. Because the disciples baptized individuals under his direction and under his authority. So that is why it was accredited unto Jesus. Then when we look in the book of Acts, we recognize that the apostles also baptized individuals. Then they Acts 2 verses, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So Jesus, baptism was accredited to him. Though he baptized none, his disciples carried out the baptism, but they did so under his authority. The apostles now, they came and they baptized individuals. So, when we mention about baptism and that a person must be baptized, we're not coming up with anything new. It was there in the Old Testament and it's there in the New Testament. So we don't come and we don't uh, and tell folks that look here, if you, if you just say, Lord, forgive me. You're gone to heaven. But we are telling people what is written in the Bible. The like figure we are unto baptism also now save us. Eight were saved. The children of Israel were saved as they passed through the Red Sea. So it is that as individuals, we need to pass through the water. And as we go down, we are going to look at the scriptures. So there are three other points that I'm going to make on water baptism. One, why is baptism important uh, or why should I be baptized? Two, the mode of baptism. We can't talk about baptism without talking about the mode. And then three, the formula for baptism. Like I said, there are many other things that we could mention about baptism, but we're just sticking you know, to the most important things because we really want to get down now. We, we have to lay down the doctrine, you know, because when we lay down the doctrine now and we get into all the other doctrines that the Bible said that we should avoid, we're going to find out how those doctrines now work against what the apostles preach and what they taught. So we must then come to the point where we fully appreciate and understand what it is that we are involving and what it is that Jude said that we must contend for. So that when we get to that point and if that ever hits us face to face, we can understand. I watched a video about a day ago, two days ago. This lady, she was asking us to pray, you know, because the, the, the Taliban, they take over and, and what, what they are doing, they are radicals, you know, and what they are doing now is that if you're not saying Allah is dead. And I am, we might not come to that, but there are folks in the world who will not give up Jesus Christ, who will not give up this doctrine that they have come to embrace. So if their head is going to be cut off, they are going to hold on to this doctrine. And that's why it comes down to, you know, it might not look that serious because day to day we are faced with a decision Tell a little lie, do a little stealing, and you know, watch watch little things that we're not supposed to watch. 
So it comes down to that. But on the bigger side, is still life and death. Though one of them, you face with somebody with a gun or a, or a machete to, to chop off your head. But it still comes down to life and death. And that is why we must know what it is that we need to contend for. So why is it that baptism is necessary? In order to understand why water baptism is necessary or important, it is, it is needful for us to consider what the Bible says about the subject. Jesus himself was baptized. He was not a sinner. Though Jesus Christ was baptized, he was not a sinner. Yet, he humbled himself in obedience to be identified with us. And gave us an example to follow. So Jesus, there was no need for him to be baptized. But it was an example for us. And he humbled himself to be identified with us. Let us look at Mark 1 verse 9. At that time, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. So Jesus was baptized and it was an example for us. Well, why is it that baptism is important and why is it that is necessary? The first point on, 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 under that text heading, it is a part of the plan of salvation. Let us go to St. John 3, and we go from verses 1, from verse 1 through to verse 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again? This is a big man asking, How can a man be born again? You know? When he is old, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let me read that. Let me read that one more time. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, he must be born again. The verse the verses that we read places emphasis on the fact that an individual must be born again. Jesus said, surely, surely, truly, truly, surely, surely, you cannot enter except you be born again. Nicodemus asks and Jesus recognized that there is some need for clarity. And he clarified him, said, except you be born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter. The 
The verse is placed emphasis on being born again. Being born again of the water and of the spirit. Jesus' exact words, marvel not. I say unto you, you must be born again. And there is no way around this. If you are going to complete the conversion process, you must be born again. Don't want to run ahead of myself, but look here. The, hosp the hospitals are filled right now. And as people lie there on the beds, I believe that folks are saying, folks are, are saying, Lord, forgive me. Because somewhere in the back of their mind, if God forgives them on that bed, nigh unto death, hallelujah, they are going to go to heaven. And as I prepare myself and I think about it, almighty God, can you imagine, I, I remember years ago, that when I was living in sin, you know what my thought was? If I went to bed and asked God to forgive me of my sins and I die in my sleep, I would be in heaven. It's when I come to understand God and understand the scripture, I recognize that nothing like that. So can you imagine the hospitals being filled and persons are at the point where they know that, look here, they have to be on oxygen. Some folks are awaiting oxygen. Can you imagine the chaos? One person said, I don't want to go to work tonight because as one person die, we just take off the oxygen and give to somebody else because persons are, and can you imagine persons lying there and because what they have heard, it, it, and you see we are getting at so many persons that are going to hell because some form of false teacher taught something that is not scriptural. Holy Ghost, somebody tell somebody that all you need to do is to say a prayer and you're going to heaven. Almighty oh, God, that is a lie from the pit of hell and hell as enlarging herself because persons have taken heed to hearing what the false teachers and false preachers have to say. But I encourage the people of God you don't have to argue with anybody else. All you have to do is to tell them what is in the word. You need to repent. You need to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you need the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I want somebody to understand tonight that look here. You, might, you, you, you are healthy, but you're not so sure. I am telling us tonight from scriptures that you must be born of water. Why is it important and why is it necessary? Because it's a part of the plan of salvation. Oh, glory to God. Mark 16 and 16. Let us look at that scripture. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Remember when we talk about faith and that belief that we expressed in God earlier on. We said that that will lead you to do something. And this is what it will lead you to do. It will lead you to get baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not he that prayed the prayer. Not he that said, Lord, forgive me. On a deathbed. I am telling someone tonight, amen, Jesus. I'm telling someone tonight that if you have prayed the prayer asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins, it is a good thing. Yes, it is a good thing that you have prayed that prayer. 
But there is something else that you need to do. And I pray to God that some of these folks that is lying on the water and is in need of oxygen, that he will bring some of them, some of them on their bed right now, and they are saying, God, if you give me another chance. Oh, God, I pray that God would, would, would give heed to their, to their prayer and give them another chance so that they can come out and come to know him, for whom to know is to have life eternal. Many folks in the hospital, we are so privileged. We are here, we are alive and well, and the grace of God is keeping us. And folks, what we know, this truth that we come to know, we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to let folks know. It might be hard to tell your father and tell your mother that, look here, you're not saved. But you have to do it. Tonight, I know that people might be offended when I talk, to, when I talk about baptism in Jesus' name. I'm talking from the Bible. It, I am that kind of person. I don't like to offend person. But look here. If it come in from the word and it offend you. Hush. But there is something that you need to do. And many folks. I believe tonight. <clears throat> wish that they could. Be healthy. And try to make it right. And our prayers are with those who are in the hospitals. But we believe that God is a fear God. And I ask myself the question all the time. Oh God, lead me Holy Ghost. There was a man, oh bless the name of Jesus, that lived next door to me for years. This man saw me and Sister Bailey before there was any children and we went to church and we invited him to church. Man don't come to church. So when the children born, come to church. This man don't come to church. This man sick and died. And I asked myself the question, how could an individual get so much invitation, hear about God, and just don't move? And I have to ask God, is it that you designed the thing that some people just, and I know God is not like that. But the man just made a decision will not accept God. And the funniest thing, he left his common last spouse. And we have been trying to invite her to church. And she refuses. But the Bible says, appointed unto man who wants to die Yay. and then the judgment uh. but water baptism is important friend it's important that we born again I want us to know that that those who are involved in this in this apostolic way uh, uh, um, that that you have the truth from the word of God and I'm not coming here to tell you something that I think about we talk about the scriptures of the Old Testament and we're talking about the scriptures of the Old Testament and all of them points to baptism. So baptism then was in the mind of God. Why is it, is, it is, is it important? It is an act of obedience. Amen. Water baptism is an act of obedience. Let us look at St. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It is an act of obedience. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy 
Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So the passage established water baptism as a commandment. Jesus was talking to the disciples and he told them, go. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the, of the Holy Spirit. There was a, it was a commandment. And the disciples obeyed the commandment. I want us to understand that that is a commandment to us even today. So though he spoke it to a particular set, it is a commandment to us also to go and make disciples. But if it's also a commandment to go, it's a commandment for us to do. Go and baptize. It's also a commandment for us to receive baptism. The apostles and the early church made sure to keep the commandment of water baptism. Several passage in, passages in Acts describe the apostles immediately baptizing nearly everyone who accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we can call out some of the scriptures. Acts 8, 15, verse 15 through to 13 and verse 12. Acts 9, Acts 10, 34, Acts 16, and the list goes on. But we'll look at some of these scriptures further down. So it is important because it is an act of obedience when we get baptized. It is an act of obedience to the command of, lo of the Lord. Then... It is important because it is for the remission of sin. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. When you get baptized somebody, it is for the remission of sins. Let us look at Acts 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter said, Baptize for the remission. The word remission comes from the Greek word which denotes releasing, wiping out, cancellation, or dismissal. Therefore, baptism is not for a show. But there is a work that is being done, a work that is being accomplished, and it is the work of remitting the records of our sins, the wiping out, the cancellation of the records of sins that I committed. Luke 24, verses 47. Jesus said, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. See, Peter said, oh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission. So Jesus said it in Luke before he left. That repentance and remission, this word remission again, still refers to baptism. Baptism is important, oh bless the name of God, because it identifies us with the burial of Jesus Christ. With this salvation plan, and, and, and look here, God is so good, this salvation plan, we must Jesus came and he died for us. And we must be identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the plan of salvation. When we talk about repentance, repentance is likened unto the death. Jesus died for our sins. 
when we repent of our sins and we turn from sin and dedicate ourselves to God, it is like a, a debt being dead to sin. Amen. So baptism now is important because it identifies us with the burial of Jesus Christ. Let us look at Romans 6, verse 3 to 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Amen. So it is a burial. It identifies us with the burial of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also he are risen with him. Through faith of the operation of God. Who had raised him from the dead. So the Bible says that buried with him in baptism. The action of being immersed in water. Pictures a burial. So when we baptize. It identifies us. With the burial of Jesus Christ. Repentance likened us unto his death. Baptism likened us unto his burial. And the infilling of the Holy Spirit is likened unto his resurrection. Amen. So let us now look at the mode of baptism. What is the mode of baptism? The mode of water baptism is how baptism is carried out. Similarly to how a dead person is buried and no body parts are left out, so it is that baptism requires for an individual to be completely submerged. The simplest answer to the question is found in the meaning of the word baptism. The word baptism comes from the Greek word which means to dip, to plunge, to submerge in water, or to emerge in water, immerse in water. Therefore, baptism by sprinkling or by pouring is an oxymoron, something that is self contradictory so how is it that somebody can say I am baptized by being sprinkled that would simply mean submerging someone in water by sprinkling our baptism by pouring would simply mean submerging by pouring it just, it just can't work so there is one mode for baptism, and that is to be fully immersed in water. I want us to understand that in this day, persons are still being sprinkled. Water is still being poured on individual. And they consider that baptism. Now, I am not the one to question the word of God. The word of God teaches that we should be immersed. That is what I am going to do. The word of God likened baptism unto the death, burial, I mean. If I put somebody in the water and they kick up their foot like that, 
As a matter of fact, before I put them in the water, I explain to them, look here, you need to just be as calm as possible. I'm going to put you down in the water and take you back as quick as possible. If ever you kick up your foot, kick up your hand, we have to do the process over. Because the person must be totally immersed in water. John 3, verse 23. And John also was baptizing at Anon, near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now John was also baptizing at Anon, near Salem, because there was plentiful, there was water plentiful there, and the people kept coming to be baptized. This is from a different rendering. So the Bible gave two reasons why John baptized at Anon. One, because there was much water there. Because there's a principle to follow. The person must be immersed in water. Bible we're talking. Then, the people kept coming Let us look at Matthew 3, verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. We can't stop there. But Jesus, so he went, he came up straightway, what? Out of the water. Which meant that he was under the water. So baptism by immersion is the only scriptural way to do about baptism. And it is the only method which illustrates being buried with Jesus Christ. So when we look at other doctrines that are saying that you can sprinkle somebody and, and because much water is not there, I remember... Philip and the eunuch, as they traveled the road and he ministered to the eunuch, he said, see there is water there. What prevented me from being baptized? Not any sprinkling. But immersed in water. So I want us to understand that the Bible is clear as it pertains to the mood of baptism. Now let us look at the formula for baptism. The formula for baptism is what is said or what is evoked over the person before the act of immersion takes place. According to both Bible and history, the New Testament church evoked the name of Jesus Christ at water baptism. In other words, the early church Baptismal formula was in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Or in the name of Lord Jesus. Not in any titles. I might be touching some corn, but look here. Is Bible be coming from? If it's the Bible that we believe in, it's Bible I'm teaching. Amen. So the scriptural record, every time the Bible records, the name or formula associated with an act of baptism in the New Testament, it describes the name of Jesus. Or it, means, it says that the name of Jesus was mentioned. All five accounts occurred in the book of Acts. Remember we said that the book of Acts is an action book. And it details what happened from the death of Christ and the working of the apostles. It records the following people were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to look at this quickly. Um, Acts 2 verse 38. And then we are going to look at verse 40 
and 41. So Acts 2 verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So now this was Peter preaching the message on the day of Pentecost. I remember talking to my father and I tell him that, look here, baptism should be done in the name of Jesus. Him say, him rather to listen to Jesus Christ than to listen to Peter. Because it was Peter say that in the name of Jesus Christ, but Jesus say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yes, I remember my father telling me that. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I spoke to him, talked to him, and that is just what he's holding on to. So Peter, the same Peter that Jesus commanded in Matthew 28 verse 19, is the same Peter now in Acts 2 verse 38, got up and began to preach the first message, the first apostolic message. And he preached to the people and he tell them when the people said, what shall we do? He said, look here, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, what I'm trying to have us to understand here is that Peter was the one that said you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And if he preached that message, it must be obvious that these people, these Jews, who got converted on this day, we were baptized by the same apostles that preach in the name of Jesus Christ. If the other apostles did not approve, then they would have said, Peter, no man, a father, son, and Holy Ghost. But they approved. And the, these Jews on the day of Pentecost were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then we look at Acts Eight and verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only that they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And here is where the record of the Sam Samaritans were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then now look at the Gentiles in Acts 10, verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed, then they pray, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. This was Peter again going to Cornelius. And from Acts 2, Peter preached and said that you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He was the one that first ministered the gospel unto the Gentiles. And if they were baptized in the name of the Lord, it's still the name of Jesus. Then let's look at, look at the disciples of John in Acts 19 verse 1 through to 5. And this is a very important scripture. Why? Some folks would say that I am baptized already. I don't need to baptize again. Oh, glory to God. Look at Acts 19 now. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast and came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. 
and he said unto them, because it's most funny, you know, if you hear about baptism in Jesus' name, you must hear about the Holy Ghost. So it's it, it funny to him. So he said, and he said unto them, unto what then were he baptized? Because it, it's strange. If you hear about this baptism, you must hear about the infilling of the Holy Ghost. He said, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of... So these men could have said, look here, well, I was baptized unto repentance by John. And some folks today, they are holding to tradition because the, the auntie and the grandma and the grandpa and the father grew up being baptized some other way or so-called baptized by some other way than in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when they have come to understand the truth, they still won't budge. But these men, they were willing. After Paul spoke to them, they said, let us be baptized. And they baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul arise and he baptized and washed. In the book of Acts 22, verse 16. Remember the same apostle that the uh, uh, apostle Paul was one that was terrorizing the church, you know. This same man went and he was present when Stephen was stoned. And he felt that he was doing the work of the Lord. So remember now, if he was, if he was against the church, persecuting the church, it means that he did not embrace what the church embraced. But when he come in contact with Jesus. And him say, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? And he said, who are you? He said, I am the same Jesus that you're persecuting. In Acts 22 and 16, Paul gave his test. Look here. He was baptized in the name of the Lord. He thought that what he was doing was the, was, was the work of God until he came in contact with Jesus. If we look in some of the other epistles, um, you will see where it contains certain references. And I want you to understand that, just like I said earlier on, if these apostles were with Peter, On the day of Pentecost, and they agreed with what Peter said. If they mention anything about baptism, it must be in accordance with what Peter said. When the apostle Paul relayed to them his revelation, it was the same thing. It was Paul that baptized the, 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 the disciples of John in the name of Jesus Christ. So when we go through the epistles and we recognize their reference to baptism, it means that it is referring to the baptism in Jesus' name. So scriptures like Romans 6, 3 and 4, 1 Corinthians 1 and 13, 6 and 11, Galatians 3 verses 27, Colossians 2 verse 12 and James 2 verse 7. These scriptures mention about baptism. And it was the same apostles, the same apostle Paul, that confirmed his revelation with the other apostles and baptized 
folks in the name of Jesus Christ. So like we have been saying, line upon line, and precepts upon precepts, this baptism in the name of Jesus Christ was what the church started with. So where did another formula came from? The time will come, brethren, amen, when they will not uphold sound doctrine. So the only verse in scripture, so we say line upon line, precept upon precept. Line upon line, precept upon precept. And the Bible, you know, when you go through the Bible, when the Bible is making emphasis on certain things, it said two times. Just like oh, when we read in, Nic in, in St. John 3, verses, verse 1 through to verse 7, Jesus said, Marvel not I say unto you, you must be born again. And then he went down in verse 5 and he said, you must be born again. So when the Bible is making emphasis, we need to take particular note. And it says line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little. So if we come in with a doctrine about baptism, we show you that baptism is coming from the Old Testament, from Noah days, from the Red Sea days. So we show you that. We also show you that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is coming from the beginning of the church. The birth of the church. The baptism in Jesus' name is coming from that. And we show you five other scriptures that we read that talks about baptism in Jesus' name. So now we get it line upon line and precept upon precept. Let everything be established by what? Two or three witnesses. Now when we come down to St. Matthew 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and verse 20, it says, teaching them, a lot of times we quote the scriptures, you know, but we don't look at the, the verses. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever what? I have commanded you. Some of us, we're not observing all things. So the only scripture that anyone could use to support another baptismal formula is this one. St. Matthew 28 verse 19. And I want somebody to show me something else. Show me another scripture that mentions about baptism in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. But you see, the thing is, as, as I talk to us, I want us to see that it is not a light thing. Now, if I say, listen, listen to me carefully, fully. If I say that somebody who says that they are baptized in the title is not baptized, probably some folks would chastise me because that would have further implications to say that I am judging and that I am saying that a person cannot go to heaven because they're not baptized. But friend, the Bible says that you must be born again. Not how you want to be born again. Not the way you choose to be born again. But how the Bible says. I don't want to wait, you see. 
until Jesus put in his appearance. Then I hear that, look here. You know, obey my commandment. Because my commandment was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So this passage that we mentioned in St. Matthew 28, verse 19, is used to support baptism in the title, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. However, in this passage, Jesus commanded the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father. The Bible is grammatically correct. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. The word their name is singular. So if it was three different names, then the Bible would have baptized in the names of. So because the word name there is singular, it indicates that the phrase used is used to describe one supreme being with one supreme name by which God revealed himself to mankind. Not three names. Not three distinct persons. And I can't understand. Just segue in a little bit. I can't understand. People justify and say, look here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And say it's three. Well, the scripture that we read a couple of weeks ago it said that the devil believed that there's one God. And I'm saying to us, people of God, that when persons believe in something that is false, there is a spirit that comes with it that blinds them. And they can't see through the words of God. The apostles understood the command of Jesus. That they should baptize in his own name. The Bible in Zechariah 14 verse 9. Let us look at that one. Zechariah 14 verse 9. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 tells us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all. So it is one God. So how are we coming with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Another thing that the apostles talk about was the, 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 the one God. And the different manifestations. But look at Zechariah. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord. And his name what? One Line upon line, precept upon precepts, here a little, here a little. To wit that God was manifested in the flesh. Jesus is the incarnate incarnation by which the Father revealed himself to mankind. Scriptures for that. John 5, verse 43, John 10, verse 30, John 14, 9 to 11. Let us look at St. John 5, verse 43. So the big thing that we need to know, baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. And he received me not. If another shall come in his own name, him 
will he receive. So Jesus come in his father's name. It, he bears the name of his father. It simply means that his father have the same name, which is Jesus. And Jesus is the name in which the Holy Spirit comes. Scriptures for that. St. John 5, 14. Sorry, St. John 14, 16 through to 18 and 26. Let us look at 26. St. John 14, verse 26. But the comforter, so Jesus came in his father's name, St. John 5, 43. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in what? My name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. St. Matthew 28, verse 19. Um, St. Luke 24, verse 47 is a parallel to this scripture. And it says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Talking about baptism again. And Jesus is the only saving name. So we get the name of the Father. St. John 5, 43. We get the name of the Holy Spirit. St. John 14 verses 16. And we know the name of Jesus already. St. Matthew 21. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. So look here. The apostles knew they carried out the commandment of Jesus. They executed what Jesus told them. Because they had received the revelation of who Jesus was. Or who Jesus is. Jesus is the only saving name, the name in which we receive remission of sins. The highest name, the name in which the family of heaven and earth is named. Jesus is that name. The Bible in Acts 4 verses, verse 12. Let us find that one. If you're taking notes, you can also look at Acts 10 43, Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Colossians 3, verse 17. But look, let us look at Acts 4 and verse 12. Acts 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Thus, the one supreme saving name of Matthew 28, 19 is really Jesus. Now, I lay out the word, but even if you don't understand, remember the Bible says that the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. But over time, if you seek the Lord, you will come to know him. And we can go into the historical records. But let me just say one thing from the encyclopedia, and then we close off. As you pertain to historical resources, there are many historical resources that verify that the early church used the baptismal formula of Jesus' name. If we look at the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, 1951, page 384 and 389, the formula used was in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are some synonymous phrase. 
there is no evidence for the use of a triune name. The earliest form represented in the acts in the acts was the simple immersion in water, the use of the name of the Lord, and the laying on of hands. To those who were added at various times and places which cannot be safely identified, a triune name was introduced at a later time. And we could go down to the interpreter's dictionary. We could, we could go down to um, a history of Christian thought and Hastings Dictionary. And we could go down to all of the, the historical data. And all will tell us that the early church started baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm saying to us tonight that you might need to consider what it is that you're in and see if what you're in aligns with scripture. Like we have been saying, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. See if what you have is aligned to the scriptures. It is best you see the Lord now, have God to open up your understanding and then make the decision. It's better you do it now than to hear but I have not known you. And you say, Lord, but, but I did mighty things in your name. Yes, but I, I did not know you. So I am imploring us tonight, those who have this revelation, hold on, on to it. Because the time is here when men are not upholding sound doctrine. How is it that somebody can have the Holy Spirit, get the revelation that they got, and still leave and gone into something else that is nothing? Only God alone can tell us. But I want to encourage us tonight that we need to contend for the faith. This faith, this doctrine that was passed down to us, we need to contend for the faith. God richly bless you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just bow your heads. Father, we come to you one more time and we want to bless your great name again. We thank you, great God, for all that was said. We pray, God, for those who are tuning in right now. Almighty God, that you will continue to bless them and continue to be with them, continue to protect them. Lord Jesus, in this pandemic, God, that we are in, we are your people and we put our faith and we put our trust in you. We know, God, that you're able to keep that which is committed unto you. Father God, we put ourselves into your hands. We pray, God, that you will remember right now those who are in hospitals, those on the ward, God, who are struggling, God, with this virus. Oh, God, we pray that you'll reach down and touch, that you will grant repentance, that you will some more, God, give them the strength to recover, almighty oh, God, and have them, God, to live up to that promise, mighty God, that they have been saying to you, that if you just deliver them, that they, almighty oh, God, will come to serve you. We thank you, God, for that which we have fasted for today, God. We pray that you'll continue to bless the marriages, God, that you'll continue to be involved, God. Help us to, to invite you in our marriages, God, because a threefold card is hard to break. We pray, God, for the leadership of the church tonight, that you will strengthen our bishop, that you bless him. God, that you bless God, the support that he has around them, and help us, God, to lift up his hands and to serve God, as you would have us to. We pray also for direction for the church. Oh God, we ask, mighty God, that in this time, that you will lead and direct, and we'll be humble enough to follow. Oh God, cover us, your people, one more time with your spirit, and hide us underneath your blood. Take full control. Lord, remember those who are not saved that are tuning. We ask, God, that you will somehow have them to consider, mighty God, 
the way, the path of salvation, and that they will understand that what we are saying is not our own words, but they are coming from the scripture. We thank you again for what you are doing. We thank you again for the yokes, oh God, that you are brave. Hey, Jesus, let your will be done. And cover your people one more time, I ask, in the name of Jesus Christ. And let the church say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, in Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Clap your hands to the Lord. Amen. Lift your hands. Lift your hands and give the Lord thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blessings. Oh, thank you for your mercies. Oh, Jesus, you have so much to give him thanks for. Amen. Thank him, God, that you are not on the word. Hey, but you are able and you are alive and well and you are tuning in and you are able to lift your hands. Some people don't have hands to lift. Amen. Some people can't move. Amen. But we give God thanks. The Lord bless you tonight. And the Lord keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. In Jesus name. By way of announcement. All being well this Friday. We will have our pan chicken. And we are going to ask. That if you are able to. Purchase a ticket. I'm going to ask you to purchase a ticket. We know that, you know, pay week was just last week, and we believe that you are able to. We are going to ask um, each and every person. We are ask each, asking each and every person to purchase a ticket. It's only $1,000, and it is in aid of a good cause. It's, a, it's in aid of the back-to-school program, and we are going to ask each and every person, parents, Purchase for your kids. Husband, purchase for your family. Amen. And let us make the thing work in the name of the Lord. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.